When the eggs hatch, the babies do not disperse yet, but crawl up onto their mother to continue their ride, this time on top. They cover her abdomen and hold on tightly as she scurries through the leaves and grass and even over the water in search of her prey. I have seen countless spiders loaded down with children, but this one surpassed them all. Not only was her abdomen covered, but her body as well. The tiny babies extended forward until they nearly covered her face and eyes. Truly a devoted, long-suffering mother. How many mothers do you know who care for 50 infants at once? Happy Mother's Day! Evolutionary theory states that all species of a group of animals will raise their young in the same general way because whatever is the most efficient method will be adopted by all. But as we have seen, this is rarely the case. Very similar creatures have totally different ways of raising their young, and yet they are all surviving quite well, all successfully rearing the next generation to perpetuate their species. Could this be by evolutionary chance or by a creator who loves diversity? When we carefully examine the animals, we find that they don't follow the rules invented for them by evolutionists. Egg-eating snakes occur in both India and Africa. They are a small family with very specialized feeding habits. They prefer eggs to all other types of food. But an egg is not the easiest thing to eat, for these snakes are not very big. When they find an egg, they open their mouth in a seemingly impossible task. Their lips inch their way over the huge mouthful. Their jaw splits into four separate parts, expanding until it can envelop the entire egg. A thickly muscled tube connecting to the lungs allows the snake to breathe despite the blockage. As the egg is swallowed, it reaches several spinal prongs projecting down into the throat. These spines slice open the eggshell, allowing the yolk and white to continue into the snake's stomach. Once the liquid is squeezed out, the eggshell itself is spit back out of the mouth, as there is no reason to eat a non-nutritious eggshell. This highly specialized snake therefore accomplishes what would appear to be impossible. Why would this snake evolve specialized parts which other snakes don't have, just because he has a taste for eggs? There is other prey where he lives that he could eat and survive quite well. So why evolve such a complex method for eating eggs? Brush turkeys or scrub turkeys from Australia have a unique way to raise their young. Instead of building a nest, laying eggs, and sitting on the eggs until they hatch, the brush turkey relies upon heat from other sources to incubate their eggs. The male piles leaves, sticks, and brush into a huge mound or compost pile. As the leaves and organic matter decays, it creates heat as any backyard compost pile does. This creates a perfect incubator for the eggs. Then various females come to lay a single large egg in the mound of vegetation. Once the female has laid her single egg, she has nothing more to do with her young. Each female leaves her egg with the protective male who guards his mound from any danger, and soon he has several eggs of different ages. He works tirelessly for months, for he must ensure that the eggs stay at the correct temperature at all times. He regularly inserts his tongue into the mound, and so gets an exact temperature reading. If it is too hot, he scrapes off the top layers. If it is too cool, he adds more brush onto the top. As the day goes by, he will do both in a never-ending job of maintaining his incubator. The eggs develop, hatch, and the chick struggles to the surface, fighting their way through all the vegetation covering them. Once they reach the surface, the male sees them, assumes they are some sort of intruder, and chases them off. He has no idea what his chicks look like. He doesn't want anything to bother his precious precious young, so he chases away his own offspring, never to look at them again. But don't worry, because the chicks are able to fend for themselves from the day they are born. They find all the food and shelter that they need and avoid danger totally on their own. They never need a parent to show them anything they have to know. Who do you think gives them this vital information for their survival when most other birds need the care of their parents?
Aphids are very well known to gardeners. They collect on plants and suck the plants' juices for food. They eat nothing but plant sap. Because of this, aphids get limited nutrient in their diet. There are some nutrients they need that they can't get from their one chosen plant. Like all life, they need a balanced diet, so how do they survive? Inside the aphid cells is a type of bacteria. The bacteria take the sap the aphids drink and use it for their own nourishment. The bacteria's waste products are exactly the nutrients that the aphid needs to survive. So the aphids and their bacteria work together in a perfect partnership. Without one, the other could not survive. How they arrived at this symbiotic partnership is something of a mystery to evolutionists. How could either have survived without the other one? Evolution takes ages to work, which would force both species to go extinct before it could partner with the other. The familiar termites that live in the temperate zones of the world usually eat wood. Termites can't actually digest the food that they eat. Termites rely on another partnership in which organisms in their intestines digest the wood for them. Once again, how a partnership like this could develop is an evolutionary mystery, because without one, the other cannot survive. This raises an interesting question. How did those organisms get inside the termite? especially since those organisms need the termite in order to live. And without those organisms, the termite cannot live. Perhaps God designed both of these creatures to coexist and prosper together. The termites in this picture are from two castes. The smaller white ones are the worker castes that collect the food, build the tunnels, and tend the queen and young. The ones with the dark heads are the soldier castes that defend the colony from any danger. These soldiers have pinchers as their weaponry. Other species even have nozzle heads that spit glue to repel their attackers. These dark-winged termites are the reproductive caste, as they crawl to the surface to disperse and found new colonies. They all swarm out at once to overwhelm any predators wanting to eat them. I found this colony emerging from a stump right as it was at its peak of the swarm. If you look closely, you can see some of them flying off of the stump. Within 15 minutes after I filmed this, all of them had flown away. The stump was clear, and the exit holes had been sealed shut. Termites in tropical areas do not eat wood at all. They eat a special fungus grown within their home mounds. Now this fungus has very exacting requirements of temperature and humidity. If the air is too hot, cold, dry, or moist, the fungus crop will fail, and the entire colony will starve. In order to meet those requirements, the mounds have to be very well designed indeed. Termites in trees will form large mounds attached to the tree trunks. Elaborate structures are built to solve the local climate problems. In rainforests, umbrella tops are built to keep off the rain. In deserts, the excess heat must be removed from the overheated mound. These mounds in Australia are built by the magnetic termites. These insects are called magnetic because they were assumed to build their mounds based on Earth's magnetic fields. The plane of their tombstone-like mounds are always aligned north and south, but in actuality this has nothing to do with magnetism and everything to do with the warmth of the sun. The flat surfaces of the mounds face the sun in the morning and evening, allowing the colony to be heated at the time of day when it needs extra heat. In the middle of a scorching Australian day when it could get overheated, the sun directly above shines on the thin top blade. So the truth of temperature regulation turned out to be just as complicated and impressive as the original assumption of magnetic alignment. The most sophisticated mounds of all are those in the Namibia desert of Africa. Not only do these termites build chimneys to convey excess heat out of the mound, but they have intricate air conditioning vanes in the lowest chamber, giving off coolness. Cool air is drawn through small holes at the base of the mound. This forces the warmer air up through the chimneys and out through holes at the top of the mound. This maintains the perfect temperature inside the mound at all times. No matter the species, each member of a colony has their own function and works diligently for the good of the society. All termites communicate with chemicals in a bewildering language of smells and pheromones. By using these chemicals to communicate, they always know what their assignment is in this exceptionally complicated civilization. 
This chemical language helps these tiny blind creatures to carry a ball of mud in their mouth to where it is needed in the mound, and in the process, build the greatest animal architecture ever discovered. Does this sound like the product of a blind watchmaker? Walruses are the clam eaters of the far north. They use their enormous tusks to pull themselves onto an ice floe, to bicker with their neighbors, or to scratch a hard-to-reach spot. They can dive down to 300 feet underwater to get their clam meals, using their elaborate snout whiskers to find them in the mud. Then they suck the meat right out of the shell, using their extremely powerful lips. They can eat thousands of clams per meal. Even though they spend much of their time in the ocean, they come to land to rest and breed. If there is no land handy, they are very willing to use an ice floe. When they first emerge from the water, their skin is very pale. To avoid losing body heat to the icy water, the walrus's blood vessels are withdrawn from their skin while swimming. Once on land, the blood vessels return to the surface to allow the sunlight to efficiently warm them. So you can always spot a walrus that has just come out of the water, as he is a pale pinkish white, while one that has been out longer will be a dark reddish brown. Sometimes walruses are not able to come to land or even an ice floe, and they have to just sleep in the ocean, which can be a problem when you're an air-breathing creature and you don't really want to drown. To avoid this minor difficulty, they have internal air sacs in their neck that they can inflate. This personal flotation device keeps their head above the water surface as they peacefully sleep. No other animal has a built-in life preserver like this. The walrus's traits are indeed found nowhere else in the animal kingdom. Evolutionary theory states that all life on Earth began with a single-celled life form eons ago. This simple cell eventually led to all the complexity we see around us now. Evolutionary theory states that all life on Earth began with a single-celled life form eons ago. This simple cell eventually led to all the complexity we see around us now. There are still a few single-celled animals alive today, but ask an evolutionist which of these forms could have been the common ancestor from which all life evolved, and the answer will be none of them. None of these one-celled creatures is simple enough to be our ultimate ancestor. Single cells are actually some of the most complex life forms on this planet. Human beings and most animals are made up of uncountable cells, each with its own job to do, each cell working together to make up the whole being that we see. Nerve cells, skin cells, muscle cells, digestive cells, reproductive cells, None of these specialized cells is available to a one-celled life form, and so the single cell must do the entire job that millions of cells do in the so-called higher animals. When we look at an amoeba, we see a single cell that must have everything it needs to survive. It must collect and digest food. It must move toward food and away from danger. It must reproduce. The idea of the simple cell is an evolutionary myth. This little creature is a tardigrade. They are also called water bears because they vaguely resemble a bear, even though they have an extra pair of legs. They are very small, 0.05 inches long. They live in marshes or ponds and eat plant cells. Now sometimes a marsh will dry out for months or years, so water bears have the ability to dry out with it. They can survive motionless without moisture for up to seven years. When the water comes back, the water bears rehydrate and go about their business as if nothing happened. These are such hardy creatures that they can be temporarily placed in an airless vacuum or be exposed to radiation that would kill most animals. Most astonishingly of all, they can be frozen to as far as minus 458 degrees Fahrenheit, warmed up and still be alive. They can be heated to 303 degrees Fahrenheit and then be returned to normal. Now these are amazing tricks that they supposedly evolved, and I think more animals should think about evolving this sort of resilience, because anything this hardy has got to be the best type of adaptation that any animal could ever have. 
surviving from minus 458 to plus 303 degrees Fahrenheit is truly a miracle. There are many animals in the sea that don't really look like animals. Amongst these are the sponges found in a huge variety of shapes and sizes. Some are tubes, some are vases, some are mounds, some are flat and crustaceans, some are hard, some are soft. All sponges are composed of colonies of hundreds of individual animals, each individual doing a different job. They work together as a colony, even though they are individual life forms. This is a very strange way of forming what looks like a single organism. There is nothing else to compare this to on land, but there are many creatures in the sea that have this colonial behavior. Some sponge cells pull in water, some digest what food is brought in, some expel water, some provide protection by having poisonous spines to repel anything that touches them, like a careless diver. Each sponge cell has their particular job. Cells have even been observed moving across the sponge's surface to get to a better spot. Researchers have found that a sponge forced through a sieve so that it is broken into its single separate cells will reform again on the other side. If two sponges are mixed together in this way, they will reform into a new single sponge integrating the previous two sponges. No other life form on this planet has the ability to reassemble itself after being stripped down to individual cells. Remember, this is called a primitive invertebrate by evolutionists, but they have abilities that the more evolved animals never dream of having. You are looking at the complex structures called spicules inside some sponges. These needles are made up of silicon or lime or glass. They must line up perfectly with their neighbors in order to reinforce and structure the colony. How do they coordinate? An evolutionist has written, quote, the imagination is baffled how could quasi-independent microscopic cells collaborate to secrete a million glassy splinters and construct such an intricate and beautiful lattice? We do not know." Unquote. Well, he may not know, but I have a pretty good idea. The poster child for evolutionists talking about the origin of mammals is the duck-billed platypus of Australia. An evolutionist has called the platypus nature's first attempt to make a mammal. These one-foot-long mammals are considered primitive because they lay eggs. Reptiles lay eggs, and all mammals are said by evolutionists to be descended from reptiles. So the two kinds of mammals that lay eggs must be the oldest version of mammals still found alive today. This would make them more primitive than other more specialized mammals. But are they truly primitive as evolutionary logic tells us? The platypus has large webbed feet that help them swim in the streams where they forage for food. For a home, the female digs a burrow into the stream bank. Webbed feet are not good digging feet. Fortunately, the webbing folds under neatly to expose claws, enabling her to dig easily. She will lay her two eggs deep inside the burrow. When they hatch, the babies go to their mother and drink droplets of milk that seep from a special patch on the female's belly. When we look at a platypus bill, we are reminded of a duck's bill. But it is far more complicated than anything a duck has. While a duck's bill is hard, these are soft, rubbery, and sensitive. They are able to sense electrical pulses given off by their prey, whether it is a crayfish, insect larva, or worms. All life gives off electricity when it moves, but hardly any animal can detect this. When a platypus dives, he closes his eyes and ears and nose, becoming deaf and blind right when he needs to catch elusive food. But thanks to his incredible bill, he can easily home in on prey and root it out of the gravel and mud. Males have spurs on their hind legs. They look like a male rooster's spur, but unlike a chicken, they can inject venom with them. They use them to fight other males for territory or to defend themselves from attack. With the exception of a few species of shrews, no other mammal has venom. Venom requires a lot of bodily resources to produce, and so is considered an advanced specialization. Evolutionists consider venom-producing snakes to be the most evolved form of snakes. 
but the platypus also produces venom and is considered primitive. Does this make any sense? The platypus has adaptations, behaviors, and modifications of the body unique in the mammal world. They have special devices and abilities that more advanced mammals do not have. How can this mammal be considered primitive when they possess what no other mammal has at all? Are these really the outdated link to the reptiles they are supposed to be? Or are they instead a beautifully specialized little creature that reveals how well an animal can be designed for its particular lifestyle? Visit any rocky ocean shore and you will encounter literally millions of the crustaceans called barnacles. They encrust every available inch of rocks and pilings and even other shells. There are many different species, each inhabiting slightly different levels of the wave splash tide zone. Barnacles start as microscopic plankton drifting in the ocean currents until they grow big enough to settle down. At this time, the youngsters glue their head to an available bare spot and begin secreting the substance that will form their shell. This is not a simple shell like a limpet, however, but a complex armor of moving parts and valves. Barnacles spend their entire lives in the spot they have chosen, unable to move about no matter what. In order to gather food, they use their feet. When the tide covers them with seawater, they open their shell and unfurl their branched feathery foot, using it to catch plankton particles. By repeatedly withdrawing their foot inside, they are able to eat whatever it has collected. This is a unique way of eating with your feet, all while standing upside down with your head permanently glued to a rock. Would you enjoy eating like this? Barnacles near the high tide line are usually tiny, while others always underwater can be quite large. Another large form called leaf barnacles are found on shore, clustered into tight bundles. Their shell doesn't cover their entire body, and their soft bases must be protected by close contact with each other. Many barnacles do not live on shore at all, but find a moving object of the deep ocean, specialized to live far from land. Gooseneck barnacles live on anything floating in the sea, usually a dead log. These large barnacles are over six inches long and have very mobile black necks. They feed with their feet as other barnacles do. As they are permanently underwater, only their vital organs are covered with their white shells. If removed from the water, they writhe about in distress, as they know they must not be exposed for long. Barnacles are amazingly diverse, with some of their relatives living in the most unusual places. This yellow one permanently lives on the underside of a crab. Here it gets nourishment and is carried away from danger. But if the crab gets eaten, the barnacle is out of luck too. This is one of the most extreme cases of specialization in the barnacle world. Other barnacle relatives called cyamids live on the skin of whales. Here we can see a southern right whale's head mottled with white patches of whale lice colonies. Whale researchers use these to recognize individual whales as no two patterns are alike. Here we can see how thick these cyamid colonies can become. Male whales make use of these rough patches by slashing them at rival males in battles for dominance, leaving scratch marks on the dark skin. So we have seen how one simple family can be found in a huge variety of forms and habitats. A basic design can fit into a plethora of special niches, showing the love of diversity of a master designer. In the flooded jungles of South America lives the Mata Mata turtle. This exotic looking reptile sits motionless on the bottom of a river among leaves and branches waiting for small fish. The shell and skin are so well disguised with flaps and projections that many creatures swim by without noticing their presence. This protects the turtle from predators, but even more this hides them from their prey. Small fish swim near, oblivious to any danger because they see nothing unusual. When a fish comes within range, Mata Mata open their mouths so quickly that both water and fish are pulled into the vacuum. Creating a vacuum like this is a unique way to feed in the turtle family. A sharp snap of the jaws and the turtle has a meal. The green scales seen here show where a fish has just been caught. The water will be drained out and the fish swallowed. Mata Mata do not want to move quickly and draw unwanted attention to themselves. 
To breathe, they slowly raise their long tube snout to the water's surface for a lungful of air, then slowly lower it to resume a patient vigil waiting for the next unwary fish. These strange turtles show the incredible ways animals can be made. There is no end to the surprises we find tucked away in hidden areas. When we think of the animals that fly through the air, we automatically think of birds and insects. Mammals are perceived as being tied to the ground or the water. But there are actually quite a few mammals that fly very well. Surprisingly, one quarter of mammal species alive today can fly. This doesn't include the mammals that glide instead of having powered flight. Flying squirrels are examples of this. We have two species in America, but they are small, nocturnal, and secretive. Asia has several species of various sizes, including a huge, woolly flying squirrel from Pakistan that has been seen gliding across a canyon 500 feet wide. In Australia, small sugar gliders resemble our flying squirrels, but are actually related to marsupials instead. They have huge eyes like our flying squirrels since both are nocturnal and need good night vision. They have the same flap of skin connecting their front and hind legs, and the same flat rudder tail. They glide from tree to tree by extending furry flaps of skin connecting their front and back legs. This catches the air underneath as they steer with their flat rudder tail. They glide about the forests at night, searching for ripe fruit and flowers full of nectar. They are social, found in family groups, and live in hollow trees. The largest glider of all lives in the rainforests of Southeast Asia and is so unique that he is the only member of his family. His name is the Kalugo. Huge folds of furry skin connect his neck, arms, legs, and tail in a continuous gliding membrane. As he scurries about a tree, his collapsed membrane flaps awkwardly. But when he leaps into space and extends the biggest gliding surface in the animal kingdom, he becomes an expert pilot homing in on a tree hundreds of feet from his launch point, steering around obstacles as he goes. He soars high overhead in the jungle canopy, rarely glimpsed by observers below. But we still haven't looked at the mammals that can actually fly like birds. These 1,200 plus mammal species are all bats. Bats are some of the most well-built and interesting animals on Earth. Many people don't like bats due to the many lies told about them but they are in fact one of the most important groups of mammals anywhere. Bats are divided into two major groups. The first group eats fruit, nectar, or pollen and is found in tropical or desert areas. The tropical ones usually eat fruit and are active at twilight or during the day. The largest bats are from this group. They have small ears, large eyes, and excellent vision to spot the fruit trees they need. They are critically important in regenerating tropical forests as they spread the seeds of the fruit they eat far and wide. A single fruit bat can transport 60,000 seeds in their droppings to new locations. This makes them the most important regenerators of rainforest plant life of any animal found there. 90% of new plant growth in rainforests are due to bats. Another group of vegetarian bats include nectar feeders found in both jungles and deserts. These bats search for flowers that are often large, white, and bloom at night. As the bats drink nectar, their fur collects pollen that they will carry to the next flower. Many plants are dependent on this form of pollination. If you enjoy eating bananas, avocados, cashews, or guavas, then you should thank the bats that kept these plants pollinated long before the plants were domesticated for our use. Many desert plants, like agaves, century plants, and the distinctive saguaro of the Sonoran Desert require bat pollination. The second major group of bats differs in both diet and behavior. These bats are not vegetarians, but eat insects that are active at night. Because of this one seemingly minor difference, these bats have been given totally different abilities and skills from other bats. They have small eyes, but none of them are blind. Blind as a bat has no basis whatsoever in reality. Bats can see as well as other animals, but they have a far better way to navigate at night. They do not rely on vision to catch insects, but instead use what we call sonar. 
Now, sonar for bats is the most incredible location sensing equipment possessed by any animal or human. Our speed detectors and naval equipment are pieces of junk in comparison. Bats must catch a flying insect often as it is taking evasive maneuvers. They must avoid obstacles like trees, buildings, cave formations, and each other. In order to do all this, they send out pulses of sound, sometimes focused through elaborate nose structures. As the sound waves travel outward, they hit objects and bounce back. The bat's large ears help them detect the rebounding echoes. A mental picture is instantaneously formed from the returning sound waves, letting them home in on insect prey and avoid collisions with objects. To have this kind of accuracy, they must continually send out sonic pulses. They are all at such high frequencies that they are beyond our hearing range. But the sounds they make are so loud that if we could hear them, we would be deafened by them. This is a big problem for the bats, since they would be deafened as well if they were forced to listen to their own calls. So every time a bat sends out a new sound pulse, a muscle contraction in their ears renders them deaf, saving their eardrums from damage. To hear the returning sonar echo, the muscle relaxes and allows them to hear again. Thus, bats are constantly turning on and off their hearing. This happens at increasingly faster rates as bats home in on their prey, until just before they grab it, they are flickering their hearing on and off at the incredible rate of up to 200 times per second, coordinated with exact timing as they send out and receive this maelstrom of sound. Millions of bats from eight different species have been observed flying together in a single Borneo cave. Each of these species produces its own unique sound call. How do all these bats fly in such high density without jamming each other's sonar? We do not have a clue. When we look at a police radar gun, don't we automatically assume that it was built by someone? A bat sonar is incredibly more sophisticated than a radar gun. Was the echolocation system of a bat built by someone, or was it all assembled by blind chance? And how on earth could the bats have survived before evolving this system? Insect-eating bats are crucial to controlling insect populations, especially the mosquitoes and gnats that plague us. They are devastating to small flying insects. A single colony of Mexican free-tailed bats in Texas eats 250 tons of insects every night, and most of these are crop pests that would otherwise eat our food supplies. This critical aid is provided free by the bats, as long as we don't poison them with pesticides or ruin their roosting sites by accidental disturbance or intentional killing, as has often taken place. Due to horror movies and ignorant myths about bats, persecution of them continues to this day. Bats do not want to bite you. Bats do not want anything to do with you. Bats do not fly into hair. Bats do not have rabies any more than any mammal. If you see a bat flying around your yard, be glad that hundreds fewer mosquitoes are alive to bother you. Besides, bats are very cute. And if you don't believe that to be true, then take a look at this little fellow. This is a bat that is being rehabilitated in Australia. When bats get into trouble there, sometimes the babies must be cared for until they are old enough to survive on their own. So every day they are wrapped in swaddling clothes and fed their milk. It is a lot of work, but well worth it to help our nocturnal allies. Relatives of the octopus, squid and cuttlefish are also some of the most intelligent invertebrates in the ocean. Squid have ten arms and a flattened body with a rippling fin running horizontally around it. They use the same jet propulsion of water as octopus to rapidly move away from danger or after prey. Their skin has pigment sacs that they can control even more precisely than octopus. They use this to communicate among the other squid, as they often gather in huge shoals. But the master visual communicators are the cuttlefish. These small cephalopods are rarely more than a foot long and sometimes barely an inch. Like squid, they do not communicate by sound or smell. Instead, they use colors and patterns that they display on their bodies. They can make waves of light and darkness travel forward or backward, fast or slow. 
They can change all or part of their skin color at will in the blink of an eye. Here is one boldly displaying an aggressive message. But then he felt threatened, and in the blink of an eye looked like this as he sank to the gravel. Moments later, he had blended perfectly with the pebble colors. He was not buried by them, but rather matched exactly the size and color of them, forming perfect camouflage. Many colors can be displayed at once. It is the most amazing visual display of color by any animal on earth. They can impart a massive amount of information in just a few seconds. They can flash colors on one side of their body and completely opposite colors on their other side. By doing so, they can carry on two separate conversations at once as they direct their signals at two different cuttlefish. This complex ability to communicate allows them to have far more intricate social lives than most invertebrates and displays again the incredible beauty of the living beings all around us. The wood frog is a fairly common amphibian that lives across eastern and northern North America. I often see these frogs as I am exploring the woods of eastern America. They look rather plain, with only a dark mask to help identify them. Unlike most cold-avoiding amphibians, they range all the way to northern Canada and over to Alaska. They live in wintry, icy climates that would kill most of their relatives. How do they survive without freezing? Well, they don't. Wood frogs actually do freeze solid in winter. They burrow down into the soft soil, and as the ground turns to ice, so do they. We are not just talking about being cold. Their bodies actually freeze all the way through and shut down completely. Their lungs stop breathing. Their heart stops beating. Their blood stops flowing. They will remain in this frozen state for most of the year, waiting for warmth to come again and free them. Come springtime thaw, their ice cube of a body begins to melt as the ice around them melts. Slowly they begin to revive, and after a few hours they go about their normal business. Can this mysterious hibernation ability be the work of chance? These small frogs testify of the extreme situations life can survive. Can evolution explain how wood frogs decided to let themselves be frozen and how it all turned out all right? In Madagascar, the large island off the eastern coast of Africa, are many strange life forms. This includes the monkey-like creatures called lemurs that live in both deserts and rainforests. There are many different forms and sizes of lemurs, but the strangest of all must be the eye-eye. He is amazingly specialized, with no other lemur remotely similar. He hunts the same insect grubs that woodpeckers tackle, but with vastly different equipment. As he slowly crawls through the trees at night, he taps his fingers on wood until he can hear grub movement under the bark. He has enormous ears to detect the slightest whisper of sound and home in on the exact location. Then he begins to chisel away the bark with his huge, rodent strong front teeth. He bites his way into the wood until he breaks through to the grub's tunnel home. Now the eye, eye must still remove the grub before it slips away down its tunnel. The woodpeckers we examined earlier use their long tongue. The eye eye uses his finger. He has one middle forefinger per hand, longer and much thinner than any of his other digits. He inserts this long skinny finger into the hole and tries to hook the grub with the tip of his claw. If successful, he can yank the hooked larva to his mouth and have a tasty meal. As with woodpeckers, these unique specializations of the eye eye are unparalleled by any of his lemur relatives. Without his huge ears for hearing food, his chisel teeth for digging through wood, and his special finger for pulling out the grub, he would not be able to catch food. Not being able to eat tends to put a damper on long-term survival. So how did the eye eye survive as they waited endless ages for all the crucial parts of their bodies to evolve? If we ever needed any more evidence that animals were not put on this planet to serve humans, we need look no further than the deep sea creatures inhabiting the world's oceans. 
These animals have been going about their own business for thousands of years, without us interfering with them or even realizing that they existed. Over the last 40 years, we have been discovering creatures we had never even dreamed possible. These are some of the most incredibly built animals on this planet, and we know virtually nothing about them in most cases. There is the deep-sea anglerfish that travels around with her own fishing rod attached to her head. The tip of the waving rod glows as bait to draw overly curious prey to the angler's mouth, where it can be swallowed in a quick gulp. Life in the deep ocean is thinly scattered. Most predators must wait long periods between meals. One way to solve this problem is to eat whatever is found, no matter how large. The deep sea swallower has a mouth so wide that he is able to swallow huge prey. Sometimes he swallows food larger than can fit in his belly. His stomach must then protrude outside his belly until the food is digested. Thus, like a camel storing extra water for a long trip, the swallower stores food. This strange deep sea relative of the common squid is called the vampire squid. She is dark red, as are many of the deep ocean dwellers. This has to do with what colors reach those depths. Being red allows an animal to disappear more easily, like a green lizard on a green leaf. Unlike most squid, her arms are connected like a hood. She has sharp, curved hooks on her arms instead of the suction cups found on other squid. At the bottom of the ocean are deep sea vents where gases and chemicals erupt in superheated columns. These vents are magnets for whole communities of abundant life. We only discovered these places in the 1970s. There are crabs, two worms, limpets, fish, clams, mussels, shrimp, and worms. New species are found every time a visit is made to them. There is a worm that lives right beside the boiling vents. The base of the worm simmers between 150 to 175 degrees Fahrenheit in the superheated water. The worm is only three inches, but that is long enough so that the worm's head extends beyond the hot water into the ice-cold water of the surroundings. There is an abrupt line between the boiling and the freezing water, and one inch makes a world of difference in temperature. And so we find a tiny worm whose head is around 35 degrees and whose base is up to 175 degrees. This is the largest temperature contrast that any animal can endure at the same time up to 140 degrees difference between two areas of the worm's body. Is there no end to the wonderful ways that life can not only survive, but flourish no matter what? These vast sea communities have no access to sunlight as they are far too deep. Not enough food drifts down from above to support them. They have no way to receive energy through photosynthesis, like all other known life is dependent upon. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants transform sunlight to energy, and all land life requires this. Not only vegetarian animals who eat plants need this, but the carnivores also get this energy indirectly from eating the animals who eat plants. But how can the animals around deep sea vents survive, since photosynthesis is not an option? They rely on chemicals coming up through the sea vents in the same way that plants rely on sunlight for food. This completely different system called chemosynthesis was said to be impossible by scientists. They said all life had to use sunlight without exception. Otherwise, evolution must have invented radically different types of life, which strains credibility past the breaking point. When the first cell formed at the dawn of life, it had to be based on either photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. There are actually only two options for evolution here. Option one, another cell had to form that used the second energy system. Option two, sometime after the first cell formed, some of its descendants switched their entire system to a totally different energy source. Either way doubles the mathematical odds of life evolving, since the systems are so radically different. Thanks to the new discoveries made in the deepest seas, we now know even more about the impossibilities of evolution being true. In all the different ways that life can exist in the oceans, we are only beginning to scratch the surface of what is possible.
Bombardier beetles have the startling ability to play with chemistry. These small beetles have several vats in their abdomens that hold special chemicals. They keep these chemicals separate until threatened by danger, like a toad or shrew. If attacked, the beetle's defenses go into action. The separate chemicals are mild and inert, unable to harm anything. But something amazing happens when oxygen and these two chemicals are mixed together. The two chemicals are sent to the well-named explosion chamber to mix together with oxygen. In a near instantaneous reaction, they pass the boiling point and are forced out the rear of the beetle by superheated steam. This caustic, blistering hot soup is aimed at the face of the attacker and will drive most away quickly. If a person picks up a bombardier beetle, as I did, they will feel a brief flash of heat that dissipates too quickly to harm them, but that leaves a dark stain that will last for a week. If the beetle was missing one of the two chemicals, the rest of the system would be useless. If there was no explosion chamber, the chemicals could do nothing. If there was no way of spraying out the superheated liquid, none of this would do much good. Remove one piece of this complicated process, and the rest is not only useless, but a hindrance to survival, as energy is supporting body parts that serve no function. This is called irreducible complexity, where a system must have all parts intact to work properly. This is a massive problem for evolutionary theory, as there is no way to put a complicated system together piece by piece over millions of years without the species dying out first. How did random mutations put together the bombardier beetle? Snakes are found on all the warm to hot land areas of the earth. They all have the same basic structure, only their size and behavior varies. All snakes need some way to avoid danger or defend themselves from attack. Some snakes blend into their background with camouflaging colors. Others are brightly colored to warn predators to stay away, since they have venomous bites and can defend themselves very well. Some snakes are so large that no predator will tackle them once they survive their vulnerable youth. Some snakes are very slow and sedentary. Some are very fast and active. Most have good vision. This cute little snake was crossing a road when I came across her. She normally hides motionless in green vegetation, so here she decided that there was no way I could see her as long as she held still. So she let me come within a couple inches to photograph her, never moving a muscle. Snakes are protected by hundreds of scales that cover their entire body, but none have limbs to help them move and hunt for prey. No snake is ever slimy, that is totally a myth. The scales on their sides and back serve as armor to ward off minor damage. The scales are attached not to each other, but directly to the skin underneath, giving them excellent flexibility. But the scales on snake bellies are different from the ones on their backs and sides. You can see on this baby water snake how the belly is divided into rectangular shaped plates. These scales are actually what let a snake crawl so smoothly. The individual plates hook onto the roughness of the ground and pull the snake forward in an elaborate rippling of belly muscles. I found this one as he ascended a wet, dripping rock face at about an 80 degree angle, held to the slick rock by only his marvelous belly scales. Many snakes can climb branchless tree trunks to reach food or safety above, and they do so far more easily than we would with our arms and legs. Some snakes glide over sand, or burrow in the ground, or swim effortlessly. One snake can even glide 300 feet between trees in the jungles of Asia, making right-angle turns in mid-flight. In the Garden of Eden, when God took away the snake's wings, he didn't leave them helpless. He gave them an entirely new system of movement that is different from almost any other animal on Earth. Only one group of snakes lives in the world's oceans, the sea snakes. Several species are found in warm tropical waters. In contrast to land snakes, their belly scales are narrow and small, as they have no need to crawl with them. Their tails are flattened into a paddle shape for swimming. They can remain underwater for up to eight hours, 
the longest recorded time for any vertebrate animal to hold its breath. They can hold their breath longer than a whale can. Land snakes are dependent on smell to tell them what is going on around them, but unlike other animals, they smell with their tongues. As they hold this extremely delicate device in the air, it collects scent particles. When the tongue is withdrawn, the particles are analyzed in a special organ on the roof of a snake's mouth. This is why snakes are always flicking their tongues in and out rapidly. Some people claim that a snake's tongue is poisonous, but this is of course never true. Venomous snakes are especially dependent on their smelling ability. When they find a mouse or rat, they do not want to risk that their prey will fight back and perhaps injure the snake's delicate mouth. So they bite the rodent, inject their venom, and then quickly release their hold. The rodent runs away and soon dies from the venom. The snake uses his tongue to follow the trail of the doomed rodent. When found, the snake can easily eat the dead animal without fear of injury. Sea snakes also use venom to catch fish. But if a sea snake ever let their prey go, they would never see it again. There would be no way to track it in the shifting currents and movement of seawater, as the smell would be dispersed immediately. So sea snakes need their prey to die very quickly, without struggling in their mouth. To solve this, a sea snake's venom is the most powerful venom, drop for drop, of any snake in the world. More so than cobras, coral snakes, or rattlesnakes. This potent venom will kill a fish within seconds. The snake can then eat the fish without having to fight with a creature taking a long time to die. Despite their lethal arsenal, they are very mild-mannered snakes. They do not like to bite people even when handled. This is in fact unfortunate for them because they are being rapidly slaughtered for their skins, made into exotic leather and other wasteful items. They will not strike the killers that dive underwater and take them from their homes. So we see in the snakes how God has used a very simple body shape to fit many unusual requirements. Snakes have a bad reputation for being venomous, even when only a minority are. They are also thought to be aggressive, even though hardly any will do anything but defend themselves. Self-defense is considered noble in people, but a heinous crime in animals. They are special beings with gifts and abilities that make them the amazing creatures that they are. When we study snakes, we get a unique view of the diversity and complexity of the natural world God made. Nudibranchs are one of the most beautifully diverse groups of animals found in nature. For those of you who are wondering, no, this is not a nudibranch. This is, of course, a male peacock. The female peahen is drab in comparison. Why should peacocks be so extravagant and flashy with colors and designs that don't seem very useful? Evolutionists tell us that it is because the male birds with the flashiest colors are chosen by the females, who prefer exotic and colorful feather patterns. Over countless years, the females repeatedly choose the flashiest mates, and so those males pass on their genes to the next generation. Eventually, the result is very beautiful, but pointless displays of colors, shapes, and forms. This is said to apply to pheasants, birds of paradise, grouse, and chickens, since each species has males with unique plumages that serve no practical purpose. If this is all true, then we should expect to find this same pattern in other animals that possess flashy colors and forms differing widely between species and serving no obvious purpose. So, let's get back to the nudibranchs. For those of you wondering, no, this is still not a nudibranch. This is a banana slug from the Pacific Northwest of North America. The land slugs we are familiar with have exotic relatives in the sea, and those sea slugs are the nudibranchs. They come in a bewildering diversity of forms. No two alike, each with exotic colors on showy plumes, ruffles, and tentacles that make each one a joy to behold. Here is one with its antenna pointing to the left and its feathery gills with which it breathes to the right. This is how, in fact, they get their strange name, for nudibranch means naked gill. Most people rarely notice sea slugs since most types are small. I have found many species during explorations of our coastlines, especially along the Pacific Ocean. This kind is the largest American form of nudibranch, and in Southern California I have held ones longer than my hand. Sea slugs are found in a wide array of habitats and depths. Homes include coral reefs, kelp forests, tide pools, 
rocky shores, and eel grass beds. Some are very sedentary, never venturing very far. Some range widely as they go about their lives. And some even pick themselves up and swim with undulations of their flattened bodies. Sea slugs show great diversity in their behavior as well. Many are vegetarians that browse on plants or seaweed. Some of these can take the color of what they are eating into their bodies and use it as their own, forming perfect camouflage to allow them to blend in with their food source. Many are scavengers that eat whatever they can find as they forage. Many are predators that actively hunt for living prey, such as sponges or flatworms. Perhaps the most elegant is the lion nudibranch, with their extraordinary hood. Expanded to full size, the hood collects plankton on the inner surface. Contracted down, the sea slug swallows what has been caught and then unfurls the hood again, over and over. A frill of tentacles around the edge warn of any obstacles or danger that might damage the sensitive hood. This is truly a masterpiece of design. This one floats on the ocean's surface without coming to shore. It feeds on the tentacles of stinging jellyfish that share its habitat. But instead of stinging the sea slug as they would do to any other creature, the jelly's defenses don't work. The stinging cells travel through the sea slug's body and lodge in its many frilly feelers. Later, when someone attacks the nudibranch, the stinging cells protect it as they should have done for the jelly. So this sea slug not only gets a meal from a jellyfish, but defensive weapons as well. The most amazing colors and patterns are displayed by these living jewels. I could have made this entire presentation on nothing but nudibranchs and never showed two that looked alike. A single bay along the coast of New Guinea has been found to have over 600 species of nudibranchs. So what about our original question? Why are they so extravagant and so diverse? Are they proving the theory true that females decide what a species will look like after countless generations? If it is true for peafowl, won't it be true for sea slugs? This would explain why they have so many different colors and forms that serve no real purpose other than advertisement. There are two problems with that solution to this question. First, each individual nudibranch is both male and female. There is no female choosing any male. When one adult finds another of their own species, they are good to go. Here is one laying its eggs, which look like white squiggles in this picture. Secondly, and most importantly, all nudibranchs everywhere are completely and totally blind. No nudibranch in the history of the world has seen themselves or anything around them, as they only use touch to examine their surroundings. So none of them can choose anything based on colors or appearances. So we are left with a mystery that no evolutionary theory can give a good answer for. Their wild colors are not for their own visual benefit. If it was solely to warn away other animals, then a single bold color scheme would suit all the species equally. Could it be that a master designer who loves beauty and variety even more than we do decided to make these unassuming animals into living works of art? This is an amazing world that can hold jewels like this in the waters of the ocean. The nudibranchs display the full splendor of species variation and completely ignore the rules invented by evolutionary theory. The last animals we will examine are butterflies and moths. These are found everywhere on all six major continents. No matter where you live, there are examples around your home, in fields, in forests, in deserts. Moths usually fly at night and are drably colored, but not always. Some moths fly during the day and are brightly colored. These are often mistaken for butterflies. There are some butterflies that have many moth traits, such as the skippers. Many species blur the lines between the two groups. Butterflies usually fly during the day and are brightly patterned. Some moths have colors that blend in with their backgrounds and help them hide. Other moths have striking markings that let them stand out boldly. All of these colors and patterns are formed by thousands of scales covering their wings. Each scale is a dot of color. All together, they form the lovely designs we see. Without these scales, the wings are only transparent membranes. The microscopic scales are attached in rows like shingles on a roof, 
and actually make it possible for them to fly. If too many of these scales are rubbed off, the butterfly or moth will not be able to fly at all. That is the dust left on your fingers when you handle one. No matter the kind, all butterflies and moths go through exactly the same life cycle. All of them start out as a tiny egg laid near the plants they will eat. They hatch out of their egg and begin the one purpose of their young lives, eating. They are an eating machine. Every part of their body revolves around eating plants. They have stubby legs tipped with claws or suction pads that can grip fiercely any leaf or twig. Since they were laid right near food by their mother, they don't have far to travel. They don't have antenna to read distant signals, and their eyes are simple dots that can only see what is right in front of them. Their jaws are built to chew and shred leaves, and their body is one long digestive gut to process food as quickly as possible. Of course, they obviously have no wings. They live in a non-stop feeding frenzy until they have grown big enough to move on to the next stage of their lives. Only now does one of the key differences between butterflies and moths become noticeable. A butterfly will find a twig or a nook and their outer skin layer grows hard and becomes a protective shell. This armor is called a chrysalis. A moth will find their own nook and use built-in silk glands to spin a layer of silk into a protective sac. This silken case is called a cocoon. Whether in a cocoon or a chrysalis, the time has come for them to change, and what a change it is. They turn into liquid soup inside the shell. If you broke them open, all you would see is a formless mass of goo, which is not something you should be doing anyway. Every bit of their body, legs, eyes, mouth, brain, and digestive system break down into this soup. Out of this soup, new tissues are built again, totally different from what they began as. The adult form is built completely from scratch. Silently and without fanfare, the greatest transformation in the natural world takes place. And scientists do not have a clue how this works. We have analyzed the process and can document its progress, but we can find no control center managing this seemingly impossible transformation. For remember, there is no brain left intact in there that can be running the show. Their brain must reform out of the soup along with everything else. Think about this miraculous process the next time you see a moth flying around your light. After they have finished their transformation, it is time to begin their final life stage. Their case splits open and they slowly crawl out. Their new wings are wet and shriveled as they have been tightly packed inside until now. They pump up their wings with fluids from their body until they are fully extended into the final shape. The wings soon dry and harden, and within a few hours are ready for their first flight. The moment finally comes as they take off and begin a totally new existence. Let us look at the way they are built now. They have six long thin legs that can perch on flowers with ease. They have a set of long antenna for reading distant signals on the wind, like a food source or a potential mate. They have huge compound eyes that cover much of the head, warning them of any far off danger. Now they will never bite a leaf again as they have a long tube tongue to drink nectar from flowers. Their digestive system is totally reworked to handle a liquid nectar diet, which won't ever make them grow bigger but will give them plenty of energy to fly. For of course they now have four wings that carry them everywhere they will ever go, sometimes hundreds of miles in long migrations. Is this the same animal that went inside the chrysalis or cocoon? If we hadn't watched a caterpillar go in and an adult come out, we would never dream they were the same insect. The process is an extraordinary achievement. Everything about them changes. There is no aspect that stays the same. How this is possible, how this could have evolved, is truly one of the mysteries of nature, because there is no evolutionary system proposed as to how any animal could evolve the ability to totally transform itself it is simply impossible to conceive how this could ever have just happened by the random chance of natural selection. Butterflies and moths are everywhere in our backyards, forests, and meadows. We see them all the time, but we really take for granted how much of a marvel their life actually is. For there is no better way to explain their astonishing ability except as a miracle of God.
As we examine nature, there is exceptional evidence for a creative hand controlling all that we see around us. How can evolution explain what we have looked at here? The animals testify to a master watchmaker far more than they do to evolution's blind watchmaker of random chance. When we look at a woodpecker smashing his head against a tree without injury, when we see a thorny devil drinking water brought straight to his mouth, or a four-eyed fish's unique eyes, do we see a pattern of design or accident? Does a sand grouse soaking up water in his feathers, or an octopus sneaking into a crab tank make much sense from an evolutionary viewpoint? We have looked at spiders dutifully caring for their babies, snakes that only eat eggs, walruses with inflatable neck sacs, and brush turkeys that can read temperatures with their tongues. Even in the realm of the microscopic, we find partnerships that can't be well explained with millions of years of development. Tardigrades are able to survive temperature ranges found on Mars, while sponges have a structure so alien to what we are familiar with that they can reform after being broken down to single cells. Animal variety is so vast that mammals include such diverse forms as egg-laying platypus, and bats that can catch a mosquito in pitch darkness. Cuttlefish communicate with waves of colors. Wood frogs freeze solid every winter. Eye eyes have a finger so special that there is nothing else like it. The seas contain life so strange that we barely understand how it lives as well as odd relatives of familiar land snakes. The complexity of bombardier beetles defies the theories of evolutionists. Nudibranchs are a living parade of artistic design, revealing how many variations can be built around a simple outline. And finally, we have the unexplainable miracle of the total transformation of butterflies and moths, occurring all the time but still a mystery. In Job 12, verses 7 to 10, we find the following. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. I hope you all enjoyed everything. It's cold and uh, cold and icy out there. I figured some lots of animals and nature and how wonderful God is and the things that He's created. You enjoyed it. Shall we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your many, many blessings. Thank you for all these beautiful creatures that you have created. And each one shows your hand in the creation of them. It just shows us how much you love us, that you created all these beautiful things for us to see and to watch. Lord, thank you for being with us through this day. And I pray now that you'll be with us as we go through this coming week. Help us to find that one person to give our new steps to Christ to. Help us to be a witness for you this week. Watch over us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming.